Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much as always for listening. Today, we're going to unpack why a $700 million producer and a $42 million producing agent joined forces and the future of real estate. That is the topic of the day. So if you're a longtime subscriber, thank you so much. If you're new to the show, make sure you hit the subscribe button and uh, cause we just want to keep creating cool stuff just for you. So I have two amazing people here. They are the point of this show today. Andy Dane Carter, Long Beach, California, Tim Smith, uh, coastal Orange County, California. Fellas, you've both been on the show separately. Now you're together. Is this a trend? What the heck is going on here? Timmy, I'm going to start with you. What is going like, like, actually, no, I'm, I'm going to totally like no editing ever. Andy, Andy, you went like zero to $42 million in sales. And then you joined Tim Smith. Can you please give us the, like the, uh, the audience, the listeners, what the heck were you thinking, man? Sure. It's all because of Tom Ferry and the Tom Ferry organization and their <laughs> skills. Um, no, so for hold me, on, man. Every every manager is going to be like, "Wait a minute, Tom Ferry's recruiting people." No, oh. not like that. Not like that at all. So here's how the whole thing, in like a small little nutshell, yeah, literally happened. So I'm speaking at Summit two years ago, mm -hmm. and I walk into this place, and it's like this crazy event, rock star event. It's my first summit ever, and I was like, "Yep, what is going on here? This is incredible." Every person I talk to from so many different countries and all over the place, all these different brokerages. I was like, what are you feeding these people? This is crazy. Everybody yeah. was amazing. I'm sitting backstage. I'm talking to Tim. I'm talking to the Gala. I'm just talking to your whole world. Yeah. And I was like, I'm missing something here. I've been like a strategic investor for a long time. I go, but this like traditional real estate thing, like it was, it was this weird kind of calling. I was really, really burnt out with the stuff I was doing before. And I decided yeah. right there at your event, I was like, I'm going to create a little team, like a little SEAL Team 6, as you guys call them. And I'm going to yep. try my hand at this and see what happens. And I literally just took all the tools that you teach, Tom. I signed up for coaching. I'm like, I'm just going to do whatever I'm told, just like Tim did 2008. And yep. I'm just going to listen. I stayed very coachable. I marketed my face off. I did was I was, I, I, I love to brand and market, as you guys know. And yep worked and it worked really well because I was just willing to work really, really hard. And like fast forward a year, I was like, I kind of want to be with the best. And I, you know, and I was slowly watching Tim set these records and I'm just like, that guy's a machine. And yeah. I just vibed with Tim and you know, here we are. So Andy, I think the future and Timmy, I want to get your perspective here. I I'm going to make the statement in 2015, Tim, you were there. I came out and I said, there are six major trends that are going to impact real estate going forward over the next few decades. Number one thing was total team domination. Teams are basically going to eat up the earth. Number two, teams are going to start to sell, which I was kind of right and kind of wrong because some teams sold about 65 teams documented sold in the last five years, like bought for cash. But a lot of teams were acquired by just writing checks and giving stock, right? So kind of off there a little bit. We should talk about that. that. We should talk about that too. We are going to talk about it. But now I've seen in the last, in the last probably five or six years, I've seen these $25, $30 million producers join into a team. And I want to, I want to unpack why do we think that's a trend? But Tim, from your perspective, why did this happen before we get into all the trends and sort of analyzing all this? Well, so we've gone back and forth for years. Do I play? Do I coach? What do I do? And I've always right. kind of had the same size team. We haven't grown much, but I always had kind of like this big lofty goal. I wanted to get to half a billion on my own. And for some right. reason, once that hit, we had a discussion and then things just kind of unfold. And to be honest, our transition up and through, through our transition is similar. Andy and his eyes transition is similar to when I started coaching with you, because all right. of a sudden we start doing this and we start really pushing, pushing, pushing. Yep. No, we've been like this. But as of an hour ago, we just got that listing signed yesterday, which will be record sell. I remembered yeah. why I love this business so much. We had a listing appointment. The people fell in love with us. They're like family. Like we are going to be their family. They signed the listing today. And I remembered like what this is all about. Because sometimes you get so like, 
I got to do this many, especially when you have a record year, we sold 705 million. Like, how do you follow that up? How do you have like a Super Bowl performance and go right back into it? And sometimes you forget why you're doing it. But when Andy and I sat there for two and a half hours yesterday, and we were having heart to hearts about kids and this and that. And these people are like, we love you guys. Like there's like a true like love and not only a true love, but there was a true respect, both doctors, three yep. sons that are doctors. So they understand being an expert in the top of your field. They had like so much respect for what we've created. And they basically said, we want you just to do what you do. So we'll sign the listing. We send it over. We got pricing to them. So that's, but when I met what I've always wanted to be, grow a team where people have the same values. And Andy and I, although our first couple of listing appointments were a little choppy, one I got thrown out of, which we can talk about, which was really odd. We have to talk about that. But I helped him, I helped him get the listing, I think, because I was that bad that there was only one agent left in the room and he was trying to co-list it with me and he got that list and he sold it, which I don't know, things happen for a reason. I've never been thrown out of a listing appointment before. Um, but as he, as we started connecting more, I thought I'd like to build something. And instead of making all about economics, it's, it's become about growth. And if you can focus on like the growth and if you can take it. And the one thing that I saw that was really, I mean, it stood out to me. You said, why would a $704 million and a 42 million Andy's got a brand and a capacity to do three, 400 million. I, know. I don't know exactly how he gets there. I know you see the same thing, Tom. Yep. It's about how we support and how we push and how we get to where he will. Because in a decade, I think that he'll be there. And for me, I want to be a part of that. So I can't help but think, because I know it's early on in this relationship. And take, take music as an example or the NBA as an example. Like there's very few Rolling Stones where the core band with all those egos you know, Mick and Keith probably being the two primary, right? Which we like you two. There's very few that survive. There's way more stories of the Beatles. I don't know if one of you has a Yoko Ono that we need to be nervous about, but like there's way more teams that blow up because of like ego and all this stuff. How do you guys, how are you going to get over that? How are we going to keep this thing united and fun and fresh, not for the year, but for the next two decades? I think that what, how I would answer that, it's just like any people perish without a vision, as long as we're a part of like the same vision of growth. And it's been a challenging three months, right, Andy? I mean, it's been a difficult start. Like what was the best year ever last year has become like the most constrained inventory ever. Every seller wants too much or they want to pay you nothing to sell their house. So we're having like these weird, like growing cranes right when we're starting you know, last year, Andy went on, I think, around 10 listing appointments. How many have you gone on so far this year? Uh, 29. I went on seven last year. So 29. So it's like all you can do is focus on doing the work. And like yeah. yesterday, we literally listed the best house in Sill Beach. We're going to sell with multiple offers. It is a it is a stunner. But it's just like that's that's like it's kind of you do the work. And the, the, the universe supports it through other channels. You know what I mean? And so I think my answer would be, as long as we have vision and we have vision and we're working towards that, even though it can get frustrated, the economics can change this, all these things happen. I think that's the thing that keeps us through the next decade. But otherwise, I think like all the people that I've worked with that I don't work with in the past, there's very few I don't have great relationships with. So I'm, a, I'm happy to be a part of anybody's process and anybody's journey. Love it. Andy, how do you keep this thing together? <clears throat> it's really easy for me. And I got really clear at the very beginning. I have zero desire to be Tim Smith. Zero. I want to support Tim. I want to support his growth. He wants to support mine. We both love to film. We both love to market. But at his yeah. core and at my core, we're customer service fanatics. Like we truly yeah. care about our clients at such a deep level that like, it, it's, it's never going to be about ego for me. You know what I mean? And we have a very similar moral compass. We like to parent similarly. Like we like a lot of the same stuff, but at the same time, we have a similar worldview. And I think that's where a lot of people get confused where it's like, 
like like I'm I'm not trying to go into Newport and crush it. You know what I mean? Like I like where I'm at. I'll take Seal Beach yeah. to Long Beach to the South Bay all day. That's why I I mean he's not he's gonna help me for sure and explode the playground that I want to be in. But like I don't want to be Tim and Tim doesn't want to be me. And we'll stay in like he's got incredible talents and so do I. And I think we're just gonna support each other in those. But so at the end of the day, you, it's yeah, got yeah. but it's got to be about business. There's got to be a scoreboard. I'm clear on that, right? right? And if it, if right, it sure. doesn't get to that, it just doesn't work, right? So it's like, yeah. And I think that's where you've helped me the most stay focused. Like, if there's anything I th- would say my strengths and I have a lot of weaknesses, I'm very hyper focused on the basics: blocking and tackling, listing appointments and contracts. Right. You're going to have ups and downs, but if you go on enough listing appointments, you're going to have contracts you're never going to really need anybody else, right? You're, right. you're, you can support, you can help produce, but it's like, that's like the key. And that's what, what I really want to see because Andy's brand is big enough where it seems like he should be doing three or 400 million. Right. And I know yeah. that he can, cause he's got the skill set. So it's just like, how do you get from there to there and how do we do it together? So Timmy, how many how many listing appointments have you been on? You know, stated goal of three hundred. How you doing year to date? I think I'm probably I could get the exact, but I'm probably around eighty two, eighty three. So I'm okay. I'm behind, but I'm pretty close. Yeah, yeah. You know, so 80, it's like I have to go on basically, you know, twenty five a month, which I'm pretty close. Yeah. So twenty five. And it hasn't so been easy. easy. It hasn't been easy this year. Like yeah. this year. Yeah. yeah. So let's look, okay, let's talk about this. Andy, why did Tim get thrown out of a listing appointment? Here we go. Okay. So <laughs> this is, and it's, here's a, here's this is the by the way, the moment that I want on Instagram and all things that get cut up. This is, this is the talk. Why did Tim Smith get thrown out of a listing appointment? As soon as I left that appointment, I called Tim and I go, look, bro, I'm never going to breathe a word of this to another human. Like I was already in like, dude, I got you mode. No one's going to know like all that kind of stuff. Right. It was probably the most weird and odd scenario I was in in my life. We're in this beautiful home, marble front, custom build and Rancho Palos Verdes, absolutely gorgeous property. I'm like, look, here's, here's the vision for the property. And I really think that Tim is the perfect partner. He's a marketer. I'm a marketer. And we're going to crush this thing together. And Tim comes in, you know, he's like, you know, he's doing his thing. There's a cool little cadence going on. They're both like super excited. Tim's kind of talking over him a little bit. He's kind of talking over Tim a little bit. Everything in my mind was fine. It's Tim on the couch, the seller on the set. There's a huge couch, other couch, me and his wife. And we're all just kind of talking, doing our thing. The dude goes, you interrupt me one more time. And I was like, where did that come from? Right. He was super triggered. And I was like, so I started to think like, what's that about? Right. It's not about Tim. Like, right. So like, what's it about? Sure enough, about two minutes later, Tim was trying to finish a very clear point on this and pricing. He stands up and goes, get the fuck out of my house. You interrupted me again. Like, And then storms out of his own house. And he I'm sitting there house. just like, I'm like, what just happened? But what, like, that, that is exactly what happens. So he storms out the back door and he's walking and pacing. And the guy's a nice guy. Like, I don't know what it is. Sometimes you just, there's just a, so me, Andy, his wife, and I guess kid are looking at each other. Like, so I stand up and I just go over to him and we're nose to nose in his kitchen. And I'm like, dude, we're going to get like, I'm going to take a blow right now. I just said, Hey, I am tremendously sorry. I didn't, I guess I didn't understand the cadence of us going back and forth. No disrespect. Happy to leave. And he's a great guy. I bolt. That was it. It was so intense. He's actually become a very close friend now. He knows that Tim and I have partnered. He's like, that's such a great deal. He's a good dude. And I was like, where was that in your living room, bro? He was, he was upset. His home was on the market for almost two years with four of the top agents in Southern California. Didn't sell, got really frustrated. Tim basically teed it up for me to be the rock star of the century. I sold it 60 days from that day, cash in the middle of COVID. And he was thrilled, absolutely thrilled. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we had another listing with this other gentleman and that didn't really go so well. We had a bunch of conversations, but it was like just enough time for like Tim and I like to just kind of jam together. And I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah. And to think that we're teamed up after I literally got get the fuck out of my house is what he said. Get the police. And I was like, I didn't know. So then instead of like just walking out, I wanted to apologize, make sure he understood like this was a miscommunication. And it was like nose and nose. And I think Annie thought he's like, I thought like like you guys were gonna duke it out right in the kitchen. And then I, I walked for, out. for sure he was gonna punch you. Like he's that guy too. He's definitely that guy. I was like, dude, if he hits Tim, I'm gonna have to get up and tackle him. Like, this is not gonna go down right now. I just wish Chris Stacy was there. See, he's the one that does all their films. I wish Chris was there filming this whole thing. That would have been legendary. It was so, incredible. Wait, Tom, Tim, I have a question for you. Was I that, have a question. That, well, it, yeah, go ahead. What happened with Compass? I didn't even know it sold until it sold. It went IPO or whatever. Tell us about that. Yes. Uh, well, they released their S1, which is the statement, and they went public, was it last week? I want to say at $20 a share. I don't know what it's trading at now. I think it went down to maybe 18 so does that mean all these agents out there I'm now are, searching in the middle of my wealthy, own podcast to look. So does that mean all these agents out there are like all wealthy now? They're all going to retire. So we'll have less agents. No, so I, I, just, I <laughs> no. just heard that there's more, there's more real estate agents right now in the United States of America than there are listings. Uh, fun fact, that is absolutely the case. And I think we're, we're north of like 1.55 million licensed agents in the U S but an interesting stat, now an older stat, so in fairness, get this, uh, midway through March, 40% of the agents had not closed a transaction in the single greatest real estate economy I've seen in 31 years. Think about that, 40%. And the balance I describe as, and it's, it, I think there's something to it here with the two of you guys. Think about this, guys. The balance are all selling houses, but they're either stuck or they're scaling. They're either stuck, they're out of time, they can't get listings, right? So it's a resource play that's holding them back versus the scaling team, which is you guys partnering up one plus one equals five, right? How do we help more people? How do we take what we've done, those brilliant basics and scale it larger? That's who's killing it right now. But yes, that's, that is true. There's one part of the equation you didn't say, as I've been thinking, I've been thinking this. So we were lucky to be represent the deal or one of the parties in the deal that was for 61 million last year. Right. right. And I've been saying, as long as I've been a Tom Ferry, Ait, that right. orange County real estate is the most undervalued real estate of any right. of the major metropolitan areas we compete against. Right. Yep. And so I was thinking about this and I've been thinking, I might say, I'm saying it's like I was in Vegas and I was at a private country club and they're selling paired homes that have a view of a couple fairways and the strip for six and a half million and they're less than 3000 square feet. Right. I can't that's even summit. get that for Bayfront stuff sometimes. Right. Right. So then I was thinking when I was driving through Corona Mar and I see the Altman team, the Oppenheim team, the, right. all these teams coming down here, the Kermit team. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? They're like the Grunion, right? Grunion are the first two fish that go out and check out the beach for a while. They have yeah. like where the demand is. Everybody's coming to orange County. I don't care what happens from a tax standpoint because it's about lifestyle now. Yep. Everybody wants a place Southern California and from South Bay to San Clemente, like all we need is a very small per percentage to be the largest team in the, in the world. And we're going to get it. We need the right players and we all have to be selfish and we all have to think about what the vision is. Right. But we are yeah. in that area. I, uh, I concur a thousand percent, but let's get, let's get tactical on the podcast for a second here. Andy, you went from seven to 29 listing appointments in, in 12 months. Be put on your, put on your teacher head for just a second here. Tell people how you did it. What's the, what's the lesson? What was the tactics? What was the approach? How did you go from seven to 29? And we're only at April 6th or 7th. Yeah. And it's because of that guy right there. He goes, let's literally cut out all the stuff that's not creating money. Yeah, I can get stuck in the marketing and the whiteboard. I'm going to this meeting, I'm doing a podcast. And he's yep. like, look, man, like if you wanna hit your goals, here's what you gotta do. 
And it was, I mean, it was a quick meeting. It was maybe like 15 minutes. And I was like, all right, I got to go on three listing appointments a week. And the first thing my brain said was like, I don't know how I'm going to do that. Yeah. And so I was like, I got to get better on the phone. So got a phone coach. I decided to like, just cruise through my phone and start calling people. Yeah. And that's what I didn't do last year. I was super successful last year and like full transparency. I probably made 20 phone calls the whole year. <laughs> but not all at year. once. No. Like Tim, could, you imagine, could you imagine that? Yeah. It's so funny though. Hearing it, it's almost like a diet, dude. He just basically yeah. went on a diet. Yeah. He just got everything out of his life. But what's interesting is this is a different year. If you would have done that last year, last year, people wanted to spend money. And people want to list houses unlike I've ever seen, right? All you had to do is just kind of work last year. Yeah. This year's different. Like it's a grind. Everybody's yeah. thinking more about what they're going to make and cost and this, and everybody knows it's the greatest. So, but the input's the same, right? You start yeah. eating the right food, then you start reducing the body fat. So the income will come. And right now we're there because it's like, okay, we have these listing points. We have these listings. They're not selling as quickly as we can. We're not generating the revenues we want to make this. But then you have like a, you know, a grand slam yesterday, which is going to be like, we're going to take this listing and blow up Long Beach because it's that listing with the greatest yeah. collateral ever. Like I'm already, yeah. and it's like, it's a, you know, $12 million listing, but it's like a double lot on the beach at Sill Beach. They call it the Gold Coast 44 homes. They never come up, right? We're just, it's going to be like the springboard to, opening up this new whole geo and digital farming in that whole area. Okay. We're going to get into marketing, but I want to go back and say, so Andy, so, so t no, no, it's perfect. Tim. I, I love the yin and yang here. Timmy says to you, look, man, cut out the fat, right? Get on the phone, call the people in your database. What like, so, so what did you do? How often, what did you say? Like, just give us some, like, give us some hacks, give us some tactics. I completely fumbled the first three weeks. Like, I was calling my friends like, dude, you want to sell it? Like, I it was the worst because I I could I could literally grab a microphone, go on stage in front of ten thousand yeah. people, and just crush. Right. Yeah, you tell me to pick up the phone and call my friend for business, and I'm like, hey, bro, how are the kids? Ever think about selling your house? Like, it was I was terrible. That just wasn't my thing. So yeah, yeah. I put all the ego aside, got super yeah. you know just transparent with myself. And just said, look, I'm just going to do this. And then I still fought it. And then one day I made 79 calls on a Friday. And I was just like, and that was the thing that broke it. And I was like, look, I got, I mean, I got hung up on from all these different super random numbers, but I was just like, this is the basics that I know will work. I got to get out of my own way. And then it became a little easier. Yeah. And then I work with my coach on a couple of things to say. And then we finally got really clear on like, you're really good at talking to investors because you're an investor. Yeah. How about you talk to the people that own a bunch of twos, threes, and fours? And now we're getting granular with like, who lives in these high-end homes on the water that, oh yeah, have a couple properties as well. So I call them not to talk about their home, like, you know, here on the water, yep. I would like to buy their income property. And it's just a way for me to then have that conversation with them. I build trust for poor. Hey, can I come by and talk to you about your, oh, what a beautiful home you have here in Naples. You know, yep. it's just, it's going to take a little bit of time as everything does. Yeah. But I'm just it, like, again, this business is so basic. It's painful, but you have to be really, really good at the basics. Yep. And I skipped over all of it. I literally got my license and started flipping houses. Yeah. Yeah. And then buying duplexes and then raising capital and buying, you know, multi units and right. So so, so Timmy, what, how are you, go ahead. You're going to make a comment. I want to know, I want, people are probably listening going, the guy's got, he's done 82 listing appointments this year. Like, how is that possible? Like give, give people some context, some flavor around your daily disciplines around follow-up, reaching out to your database, like give people some context. Okay. So, but it, I was just going to comment. That's a perfect yeah, please. question. It's, it's not just about being intense and intentional it's about being consistent like this is right. a uniform yeah this is what we wear this is who we are and like whatever is keeping you from making calls and whatever it is it's good reasons mine i have too many listings that we're bringing on i have to go meet with my 
all my people that are remodeling and make sure the house is there. And we're going through all these renovations right now. So whatever it is. So for my scale, it's like, I shouldn't be doing that then. I should have somebody else meeting the stage or the painter that, that, that I could do. And so it's being really intentional about those basics. And it's something that it's so simple, but it's so difficult to do. And especially, I mean, the, the thing that's interesting about this market and why I haven't had to prospect as hard as I have in the past mm-hmm. is because there's no open houses, there's no broker previews. Right. So it's like, and I am such a digestible call for anybody right now. Yeah. And it's really like, hey, Tom, and we could have this call right now. You now live in Dallas. We have yeah. your house listed. We will get it sold for over market because that's where we're at, right? But who do you know? Who else do you know that's thinking of selling? Like, honestly, who do you know right now? Do yeah. you know anybody? Like in your circles from Shady Canyon, are there people, you don't have to tell me their names or you don't have to hook me up, but do you like know any person that's like thinking of moving out? You, I know like five people. So like yes. Who? So who? You, no, I can't say the name on my podcast. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So but, uh, that's, but that's, but that's what I'm doing. Right. And okay, when, so, so hold on, Andy, when you hear that, like, I, I don't think you could have done that. I don't think you maybe potentially either in your own mind or whatever in the universe, you earn the swag. But Timmy, if, if Timmy calls anybody and he goes right into it, because like, like that's Tim Smith. Your vibe attracts your tribe. Everybody loves Timmy. We all know what he does. We know he does it at a high volume. He's got a beautiful wife. He's got a beautiful family. He's got this high power business. He does these crazy films. So it's almost like an expectation where... I think if you tried that, maybe in the beginning, you'd whiff it. Or what are your thoughts? That is exactly what I did. But I took that page because that's exactly what Tim does. He goes, I literally call people and I say, who do you know that's thinking about selling? I'm like, that's it. And he's just like, all day, (laughs) over and over. Everybody. And it was just like, huh. And then sure enough, I mean, I take notes. I listen to Tim. I'm super coachable, super trainable. And I just, we'll just try it. And then like, you know, it's my own little thing, but it's the more you do it, it's, it's just like working out. Business is so much like working out, especially this part of it. Like you, yeah. you have to be consistent. You have to do a, a lot of crunches to get abs, but you also got to eat really healthy. You know what I mean? So yep. for me, it was like, what am I not doing it was clearly wasn't making my calls last year. Clearly wasn't going on nearly close to enough listing appointments. And the first thing he asked me too, he goes, so, so of those seven, how many did you take? And I'm like, I took them all. And he's like, well, you should be taking about 60%. I was like, what? Yeah. Like, That's I, a problem. Yeah. I, I, I go, I'm in, yeah, I was in no man's land with how I was supposed to be doing it. Yeah. Um, and now I'm much clearer. So, so let's, let's go a totally different direction. Listings are really hard to get right now. And, and there's a lot of sort of chatter on all the social channels and private Facebook pages of, I can get the listing as long as I overprice it by 10 or 15% and I take the commission at like one and a half percent or 2%, right? So, so I'm curious from you guys' perspective, you know, what are the things you're saying or doing or demonstrating maybe differently from the past that is winning you the listing at a reasonable, a reasonable range of price and, and a fee that makes you satisfied. What are you guys doing? You start Andy. Yeah. So, so I just took seven listings last week, I had a horrific first quarter. It was my worst in five years. Um, And that was, you know, just me, (laughs) all me. But I, like I look at them and they are all completely different. They were all totally different conversations. You know, uh, seven completely different sellers, totally different motivations. I think it's like a singular thing where it's not just like a blanket where it's like, here's where you gotta be. You really have to listen to what the sellers are motivated by. and. And like, just be very, very firm with that. And it's like, you know, like there was one that we took at a discount, but we're also listing two of his properties and we're probably going to sell them in a week. So for me, I was like, you know, it's worth it. So like, for me, it's a case by case basis, but it's just to listen to where their pain points are and build that bridge for them and then hold their hand and walk them across. And like my number one thing is I want clients for life. And you know what? So to like give up a little bit or just to tell them like, look, here's what, here's what this result's going to be. 
like if you use me or you use somebody else, it's it's going to be different because they're not going to market the property like we are. Yeah. So I agree with that because I think there's a case by case basis. However, I'm kind of in a point in my career where I don't really want to work with people I don't want to work with. Right. I just don't. I don't have to and I don't want to. And you don't always know that at the listing appointment. But I can tell you, you know, going having the best year ever and doing yearly planning with you, Tom, I kind of if you've ever heard like that story about, you know, one day a kid goes out and the goose has a golden egg. And then the next day he goes out there and like a week, I don't know, basically this golden eggs and he's really excited about these golden eggs. Then he starts needing these golden eggs. And then before he goes, before he knows it, he goes out there one morning and he chops the goose's head off to get the golden egg. Like there's an element to that, that sometimes you forget about the people right. and you, and you're like, you get really hyper-focused on planning and appointments and how much money I have yesterday in the listing appointment. I remembered what I loved about sales and it's like, we spent the first hour and a half talking about kids yep. and seeing two excellent parents that are both doctors that have, that are crazy about their kids and talking about ADD and all these things. And I remember thinking like this, like human connection, it's what, what it's about. And I think yeah. the other thing for me is like, there's been a lot of listings I haven't taken because I wouldn't discount my fee. And I've regretted some and I haven't regretted my biggest thing on negotiating fees. The people that always want the lowest fees seem to, it seems to be like they're always consistently the hardest to work with. Do you know what I mean? Cause it's like, they want a pound of flesh plus they don't want to pay any fees. That's what I'm trying to get away from. Cause I think there's times that you do have to discount. And I think there's listings that I should have taken because they were strategic that I wouldn't take. And so I'm rethinking that. But the thing that's consistent for me, I got to feel comfortable with these people because once you start discounting your fees, you're given a pound of flesh, you're given daily calls, there's unrealistic expectations. That's the thing I don't want to deal with anymore. You know, um, going back to that 2015 trends conversation, one of the trends that clearly played out, and I want to talk about this, this kind of this future of real estate conversation is I remember saying commission compression is going to be greater than you've ever seen. And, and I wasn't thinking Andy back then relocations at 42% referral fee, you know, home light is at 25% Zillow and, and, you know, realtor.com are now at 35. And I listen, you know, for everybody out there, like pay attention. It could just as easily be 40 or 42. There is no doubt like that's also commission compression. So let's, let's transition. Let's talk about the future of real estate. When I say to you, Zillow and Realtor and Homelite and the 75 other, not including Lone Depot, Rocket, all these companies that have figured out most agents don't market effectively. So we will, and then we will pass on that client and take a, a substantial piece of the action, which I'm not arguing for or against. It is what it is. Arbitrage has been around for a million years. How do you guys think this plays out? What do you guys think the future of real estate is when it comes to these major players? Talk to me. So it's interesting when somebody comes in the business, what they're faced with. Like, what do you face with? Get yeah. a farm. Well, how do you farm? Three postcards a month. Be yeah. relevant. Do this, do that. Like, the opportunity is going to be those people that really add the most value to the marketing process. Yep. When you really start thinking of geo farming in a pandemic, it's very difficult because getting face to face. So the people right. that are willing not only to have those great ideas, but also to be able to execute are going to be the ones that win and make no mistake about it. People that are hyper focused on cost sellers that are hyper focused on cost always end up with less in the end. Yeah. Right. So how do you, present what are you offering what's your value added like yesterday there was no talk of discounted commissions like mm -hmm. i need more of those how do i add more value to our geographic farms besides postcards what do i do digitally what do i do personally yep. what do i do yep. so that we are that you know when you're driving down and you see the big whatever the things on the side of the freeway the what do they call those yeah. Billboards? Yeah, billboards. Billboard? We are like the billboard at every exit. Like, how are yes. we getting in their computers, in their phones, in their face, in their 
and doing it in a way that we're being like good people and we're being service oriented because really that's what yeah. it's about. Yeah. So you're actually answering my, my second question, which was how do you defend your position? And you and I, as always, are very aligned on this, but I'm going to go back to Andy. What do you think is the future, man? Let's, let's, let's just say that uh, Zillow and Open Door and Redfin, um, per my buddy Spencer Raskoff, who also just took another one of these companies public in a SPAC, I want to say he said there was something like 0.5% of all real estate transactions in the country. I need to get some data around that. So Tristan, just a little reminder. But that means that 99.5% aren't. But they're just, it's, iBuyer is just beginning. And arbitrage has been around forever. Arbitrage has been around, it's relocation businesses that have made a fortune because they find the client. Andy, what are your thoughts on the future of real estate when it comes to all this stuff? So we have big tech has come into the real estate space. If you guys think for one second, they're just going to be like, now nah, we'll just go away. You're out of your minds. It's going to continue yeah. to grow. You're, it's like anything else in business. You have to adapt. You have to be malleable in business in general. And you're yep. going to have to see what works for you and your business. I know plenty of people here in Long Beach. They're a hundred percent of their business model is from buying Zillow leads and Realtor.com leads. They work with buyers, they get some listings, that's it, and they make their money. Those go away, which they're not going to. That's a problem, you know. And I really think the twos, threes, and six deals a year agents, they're going to either join teams, big machines, and they're going to actually do some business, or they're going to slowly suffocate out of the business as the big tech continues to grow. So, but here's the thing. I just believe, especially from exactly what we did yesterday, it is a belly to belly sport. Like there's always gonna be that human touch. There's always gonna be that person who wants to buy a Tesla from their computer at home. They're gonna click all the buttons, hit ship it to my house. That's cool. That's always going to be there. Those two sweet doctors that we talked to for two and a half hours yesterday that wanted to personally walk us through their house and yeah. show us why they love it so much. And then we can paint that picture for them digitally, how we're going to market it to the world better than any other company on earth is a special experience that I don't care how much tech comes in. You can't replace Tim with tech. You can't replace Tim specifically answering that doctor's questions like a ninja. He even right. said, you ask fantastic questions. And like, he literally hammered every single one of them. That is an experience that I think will never go away. Yeah, there is something to, uh, there's a wonderful book called the, uh, I wanna say it's Humans Are Underrated. Everyone should read that book or get the audio book. And it basically talks about the five superpowers of humans that, that it will take hundreds of years for AI to be able to become Tim Smith on a listing appointment. Right. Like it's an interesting question because every other industry, their fees have been compressed to nothing. Right. right. One of my best friends is a the biggest multifamily guy in Utah. And he did like a 300. He, he's got the record for a hundred million dollar. Yeah. And like he says his commissions when he gets to his team, I'm like, that's like a 20 million dollar house. sell. Right. like, how do you even like, right. but but keeping that aside, you know, one of the things that I think like is interesting about what you're saying with like a tech and like the Jason Mitchell model, you got to figure out what's right for you. You yeah. got to trust your gut and go to yeah. work, right? There's no, I mean, the problem with opportunity is most people, it comes dressed up in overalls and a tractor. It's work, right? So it's like, yep. that's the biggest problem that people have. And then there's so much to question the conversations, but just purely going back to the basics yeah. Right. If you stay in front of it, it's going to be. And the thing that's different about that, I think on the luxury end, there is no tech company that's going to take agents out of the super high end. It needs that. It, it's like there's too many adjustments. There's no AVM that can price a house that's 146 feet of frontage on the bay in Newport. It just doesn't. And the yeah. thing is, it wouldn't come with a competent presentation, but there are those people that will because they want to do it for 1% that will sell their houses for less. They just don't yeah. know they're selling them for less. Yeah. Going back to what you said earlier, Tim, I think it'd be interesting for us to, to go back and document every seller. Cause we've got all the data of every appointment you've been on and look at those that were grinding you on fees 
and then research their final sales price versus your original proposed list price, right? Because if you actually have the Tim Smith report that actually could document 197 presentations in the last five years, these people ground me down on this, this, and this, and ended up selling for seven and a half percent less than what I would have marketed the home for or what I would have sold it for or what I proposed. Like something like that, I think would be really interesting because you made the statement earlier and remember, you always got to be mindful of like, do we have the facts? Like I know your intuition and your experience tells you it's true, but boy, if you could document that, wowzer, that would yeah. be a killer, killer I mean, part of your presentation. I, I mean, I agree and we have this spreadsheet, but one of the things that's been interesting recently is how many people are listing their house below market yeah to do this auction bid up i don't right. even know how you sell that like okay so your house is worth four million or let's say your house is worth five million but we're going to list it at 3.9 and we're going to get you 4.2 but wait a yeah. second your house is worth five million not like how does that sales pitch even work right i don't i don't, I don't know but it's interesting I've had more people recently tell me like they just want to get their house sold. They don't want it. Like, I'm like, no, 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 but your house is worth more. Like yeah. this is the data. This is the trends. This is why we set records. This is why we sold 243 homes last year and 107 were records in their product type. It's not like just yeah. a coincidence. It's like a recipe. If you put I these ingredients in, you give your sellers the best chance to get the most. If you don't, and these ingredients actually cost more than 1%. I have to remind me, I got to send you the Seth Godin blog talking about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And his whole thing was, it's all about process. If you can deliver the right process over and over again, you're going to win. He's like peanut butter and jelly. Like you got to put the bread down first. You do the peanut butter, then you do the jelly, then the other bread. And he goes, what if you started first with like the peanut butter on the plate and then you smashed it in all the elements are there, but the order and process is why you have success. Right. And there's just, it's a, it's a beautiful example you could share with people, but I want to go, I want to go back to, I'm, I'm going to make a statement to you guys. And then I want your input. I believe that right now, the vast majority of people listening to this, they are under attack and they don't even know it. They think the attack is interest rates. They think the attack is a uh, possibility of inflation. They think the attack is a shortage of inventory. And I would say, no, the absolute attack is the unlimited amount of money coming into our marketplace with people that don't give a blank about how it's always been done. And the arbitrage game, I think is going to continue to gobble up. It's the slide I showed four years ago at the summit. Hey, it's eight or 9% is FISBO and the balance is all agents. Then it's eight or 9%. I think this year, when you look at the data, when all the numbers come out, we could be as high as 20% of every transaction had a referral fee associated to it. And I think they're just beginning. Couple I, think, I think it's probably more than that. I think I, it's more than I'm that. Being I, would say that. I would say that with all your agents, I bet it's probably 50% of transactions have a referral fee. I, I will let the data, we'll let the data ultimately decide, but whether it's 20, 40 or 50, that number, whether it's an agent, agent referral fee, which everybody's good with, but again, that's a 25% hit on your, you know, on your GCI, right? After your split and everything else, it begins to really add up. Now they obviously for a lot of people out there listening, if your average sales price is high, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of the way the world works. But I think about my client that's selling in normal Illinois and their average sales price is 178,000 bucks and they have to sell 50 or 60 homes a year to like have a living. I mean, it's nuts. And the medium sales price in the US is what, 380 now, which is bonkers in and of itself. But going back to my point, ready? So if, if we are, dare I say, under attack, I keep asking myself, what can we do to sort of Warren Buffett build a moat around our castle to protect ourselves as much as possible? Here's my list. Number one, you have to have a Google business page, N right? You guys with me? Number two, you have to over index on Google reviews hard. That doesn't mean Tim send your entire list an email saying, please do this. Cause if you had a thousand reviews on a Tuesday added, Google would say you're spamming and they would eliminate almost all of them. But like having the Google review machine being a part of your business, like Zillow reviews has been forever and word of mouth has always been in this business. Number three, you've got to create content at scale and become the most memorable top of mind agent in your marketplace, right? And you two have done this times 10. 
Number four, you've got to be a geographic farmer and understand that direct mail. Guys, I just had a, a mastermind in Dallas with like 12 agents and the, the three most successful agents in the room were doing 100,000 direct mail pieces, sometimes twice to three times a month to their communities. 100,000 a month. They didn't start there. They built up to there. You with me? And then following that, it's billboards. It's every grocery store. Like everywhere you go, you saw them online and offline. Timmy, to your point earlier, then you ready? Email marketing. The one that every agent has missed. And I've been hyping yeah, I'm writing these down right now. I know you. Well, this is good. Well, it's good. We're, we're scratching off our next coaching session. Here it is. E email marketing. Listen, my friends, for everybody watching or listening right now, Facebook, well, Canada, privacy laws are becoming U.S. privacy laws when it comes to digital. So Facebook, Instagram, Google advertising, as we know it in 18 months, could completely evaporate. So if you're not building up your email marketing list, which we all know, spend a dollar on email, you make 44 on average. It's like the greatest ROI only next to the ROR of, you know, relationships, right? So email marketing. And then the last one is make your damn phone calls. Those are my six for creating a, like a, a defendable position in the marketplace to be the force to be reckoned with. Doesn't matter who comes in. Where am I right? Where am I wrong? What am I missing? Talk to me. I got a lot of ideas around this that I want to flush out, but it's like yeah. the only thing I would say is there needs to be different ideas for face-to-face. -face. Pandemic aside, we're still going to have these vulnerabilities of no broker previews, for no sure. open houses. So all those things are building a moat, but there still has to be a real strategy to get in front of people. Yes. And, and that the people that are most creative, with that over the next five years, while they're doing all this, yep. that you just said, and I wrote it all down because as soon as I get done, I'm going to go tell my team, wait, 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 where are we on all these things? Because like constantly just driving it, yep. but being face to face is going to the other thing. And I don't want to digress, but Jason Mitchell, I've still never connected with him. We've had a few phone calls, but now for some reason, cause I talk about him, he's in my Instagram feed. Yep. Like I'm really interested in his model, but it's like so hard when we go start meeting with Mellow Homes and Zillow and Truly and blah, blah. And we start going through the process and the conversion rate is one and a half percent. Yeah. One and and half the leads percent. that they're sending me are worse than all of the leads that I have that I'm not working in my like database. Right. Yes. So I'm just like, but then I'm going to give you 42% to give me a, the only good leads I'll probably get are leads that they get that are from my leads that I'm then paying them 42% to work my business. Which is so maybe why, we should just be like yeah, anti-all lead generation. generation. So I don't know if I would go that far, but I want to hear from Andy first and then let's, let's have a conversation about this. All right. So Andy, what do you think? How do we defend our position? How do we be really what we're saying is if you don't feel you're under attack, good on you. Um, we should probably have a separate conversation. How do we create a, a, a defendable position in the marketplace where they're like, look, of course, I'm going to go to that website. Then I'm going to call Andy. Right. So for me, like this is year two, right? So I'm literally trying to do all the things that you just said, just to get market share, just to get my name out there with branding. And we're split testing everything and seeing what's working. What's really working well for branding, and this is always going to work, is Facebook and Instagram. The Facebook leads yeah. that come in, I can just throw in the toilet. We've worked them every which way from Sunday. They're yeah. terrible. They're just terrible. So like mm -hmm. there's strategic things. We're sending out these blasts and these emails to touch people. We just started doing probably seven, eight months ago, these city specific blogs that pull traffic through Facebook back to our website, which has been really cool. Like, Hey, here's the five best places to get some really good ice cream in Long Beach. Don't even talk about real estate. What's the best place to get a craft beer? Here's the six places. Like, and then we reach out to those businesses and say, Hey, why don't you come on the podcast? We'd love to hear how you survived during COVID. Now they're sharing that to their whole database on Facebook. So I'm trying to do like a lot of branding to put this face in front of all the people that like, oh yeah, he does real estate. That's right. And then they get my thing in the mail. It's like, oh, he just sold this really cool property. And then he gets an email. It's like, here's what I love to hear. It's my favorite. 
this guy's everywhere or Andy, right. you're everywhere. Right. All those things you're going to have to do to defend against this, this, you know, tech. And to Tim's point earlier, all these things with these low prices to bid stuff up at your house is worth five sellers just want to sell. Cause I truly believe there's a lot of people that really remember 2008. And if you're 49 yeah. to 69 and you lost a large sum of money, you're like, it feels like 2007, not sure if that's going to happen or not, but like they would rather get out a little bit early than be late like last time. And I'm, I'm just feeling that just within like my little crew. I would argue for, um, so Jason Mitchell and I've been talking a bunch. So Tim, we have to, we have to connect. So big shout out to Jason. If you're watching or listening, uh, very, very cool guy, Jay Gaskill, obviously, you know, who we also both know. I, I'm making the argument for the mega teams and for brokerages that they need to have their own iBuyer strategy. So for that person that is the, let's call them the convenient seller, right? I don't want it held open. I just want to get out. I just want to sell this property. Hey, sell my mother-in-law's house, you know, yada, yada. Tragically, they passed away, not my mother-in-law, but like as an example. Um, I think that we need to have that solution in place. And whether, Andy, it's your money or it's, uh, you know, you get a huge line of credit or you just go to the bank of Tim Smith, like whatever you do, I think you need to have that in place today, Tim, even for the $4 million buyer. No, I agree. I'm actually in the process with every one of those. I'm just like choking down because me and another guy on my team, I'm trying to head up the leads. I just want to test them myself. And yeah. the amount of time I'm spending chasing these leads that are just dirty. I mean, they're dirty leads. So, I mean, they don't get dirtier, right? Is amazing. But then when you do get them with a 42% haircut off the front, how do you make it work? So in my mind, I'm like, how do you scale that? Like, how do you make yeah. that work? Now it works. Like, I think the reason it works for Jason Mitchell is we've traded a few phone conversations. Jason, we will connect because this is fun. You're at 1.6 billion. We'll be at 2.2. So we'll be right up there and we'll do it with a, a one one percent of the agents you deal with, right? If he's at six, are we doing? Are we doing like competition right now on the podcast? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm about to bring Jason in to like yeah, defend his position. Defend himself. But I gotta believe. He said that he was getting, I think, three to 4,000 leads a month. Yeah. That's, it, it doesn't work unless you're scaling a lot of leads. So he's, well, he's, somebody higher, works, he's higher than that right now. Yeah. He's so when somebody's right working, now. when you have agents working, yeah. you know, they're getting one or two leads that doesn't work when they're getting 30 yeah. that are actually converted yep. leads from 300, then it becomes this thing where like they're slamming so many deals. I don't know that we ever get there coastal Orange County. And I don't know if you guys are watching I know the real estate markets, the you know 2020 real estate market was the best the world's ever seen, mm -hmm. but where I see the biggest growth are ultra luxury places, right? Yeah. Like everywhere, like, like 15. Aspen, 20. Jackson Hole, Water, yeah. Like right. The Discovery Lane Company had their best year. It's probably obscene the amount of properties that they sold, and they are the yeah. greatest second home developer. Shout out to JJ and Mike. Like you guys yeah. have done it right. And the market has supported you. All they do are private golf course, private ski resorts, you know, yacht club resorts where people are into that. And those things are going bananas because the pandemic took home and turned it from a noun into a verb. Bananas. That's bananas. But it's like um, that, that will never yeah. be the Zillow model. Yeah. That will never be yeah. that. Like they're never going to dominate the Yellowstone club or Cabo. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like, okay. And yet I'm going to, I'm going to make an argument ready. And yet let, let's, let's all do a hypothetical. You ready? So, so right now, someone in your database, they're sitting at their dining room table where they have worked for the last 14 or 15 months and they're on a zoom session. So Andy, just picture any friend of yours, right? All of our age. And they close their laptop after a, a review with their boss the two-year-old runs by, the five-year-old runs by, the dog runs by, and they're like, hey, honey. And their honey like walks in from the closet from the master bedroom where they've worked for the last 14 months. And they're like, how's it going? Well, my boss just told me we're not going back to the office for another two years, that we're highly productive and our profits are up. So we're going to stay in this environment. And in that moment, that person opens up their laptop and they don't type in ABC real estate agent. You guys with me? I'm trying to figure out how to help my clients be like, 
in a local way be bigger and more recognizable than Zillow, Realtor, any one of these things. And that's, that's my argument. Like that's what I'm trying to get to. Cause right now we all know where the consumer goes. They're not going Tim Smith group real estate. You with me? They're like, they're like, find me a home in Jackson hole. And like Zillow shows up, realtor shows up. Everybody shows up. Well, I'll give a shout out to compass. Like when they like, I mean, I, I heard kind of like what their, their objective was like they, and, and like, whether it's right or wrong. And I've asked a yeah. few people about this. They said where they saw Zillow, truly a red fin do it wrong yeah. is they tried to control the inventory by not betting on the real estate agent. Right. Like by trying to actually substitute for the real estate agent where compass is saying it, they're actually saying they're going to get market share by betting on the real estate agents. Right. And right. once they have market share, that singular platform or whatever is going to yeah. be so important, which it could be. That makes yeah. sense to me. Like it makes sense yeah. to me, you know? But I want to be clear, like Compass, EXP, if you look at like the Real Trends uh, 500 just came out and there's only three companies that have really leapfrogged the last like four or five years if I'm reading the, the report from memory. So, you know, please Google this guy's Real Trends uh, top 500 brokerages. EXP, Redfin and, uh, and Compass on a transaction basis have seen the greatest growth. And, and when people go, oh my God, I go, well, ah, listen, I've been doing this for a long time. Remember when the franchises hated these, or these independents hated the franchises like Century 21 and Red Carpet Realty and ERA, and then Remax came in and dominated all those guys. And then Keller Williams came in and dominated those guys. It's not the first time we've seen an agent-led focus. EXP is another agent-led focus business that's crushing on transactions. I still believe both those brands are vulnerable. Yeah, for sure. And that's, that's, you know, so, you know, shout out to all, you know, all, and listen, you know, you know, one of my closest friends will be here in two days. He owns a third of the globe for Remax as the master franchise. Like shout out to the Schneiders and the Pulsar family. Like they're, they're bananas, right? They are also focused on how do we make the agent experience better and the consumer experience better. My concern is again, at scale, how do we help these agents that just think too short term? You know, it's like Shaquille O'Neal versus Kobe Bryant, right? Shaq was like, I'm coming to the Lakers. If I win a chip, it's all good. Kobe showed up and said, I'm going to become the greatest basketball player of all time. Right? So yeah, Shaq won four times. Kobe won five times. But Shaq, after he won his first, he parted his face off. I'm deeply concerned for how many agents are parting their face off coming through this pandemic about how much money they've made that they're not reinvesting into their brand and protecting themselves. And maybe I'm just on a stupid high horse. I don't know, fellas. No, no, no. I, I, I'm concerned for the future. I, I feel you. I feel you. And the thing that the reason that I'm probably not as concerned as I, as, as I should be is because I'm not a coach of a thousand agents. Right. Yeah. And we have a pretty good machine and I'm not saying I'm rounding third base on my career, but I'm definitely yeah. not starting it. Yeah. You know I and mean? so like the only thing I would say is one thing that that I've always done and I know Andy's always done and probably almost flip flopped is use real estate as, you know, purchasing real estate right. as, you know, diversification. I think there's some opportunities to get revenues on more parts of the transactions. I think there's opportunities through technology and other things where every transaction you do even if you're a bigger team and you're splitting up more, yep. you're creating more abundance for your team. But it's really yeah. like, there's never been a better time to purchase real estate. And I still I think agree. it's great. And if you're looking at for anybody that's listening, that is in real estate and that doesn't own any real estate, like, dude, figure that one out. I don't care if you're going to Indianapolis or Memphis, Tennessee for 26,000, yeah. but a $26,000 home in Memphis, Tennessee, we'll rent out for 700 bucks a month. It's not like super sexy and yeah. no agents want to go in that neighborhood every time a tenant moves out. But still, it's like it's real estate has made more money for people in Orange County than I think any other sector. Right. And no, that's 20. my whole world. That that's is right. That's right. a huge reason why me and Tom actually connected so deeply. I was like, right. stop buying dumb shit with your commission, buy a duplex, 
buy a two, three, or four as your first property or your second or third. I don't care if you own a house, move out, rent it, buy a fourplex, 3.5% down. Like there is a million ways for you to get ahead. The, I mean, this is a super painful thing like for me to do, but it's also really fun for me to try this new endeavor and work like my face off. I put my family in a really good position where at 44 years old, I never have to work again. I could stop right now, close yeah. this office and go lay by my pool for the rest of my life. But like, I have such this thing to give back around that because I came from nothing. Like right. literally I'm, I'm right now trying to buy, I always get choked when people talk about this. I'm trying to buy the building that my mom like had to beg this landlord to rent to us when I was four. Like if I get that building, I'm real close. Like it's just those things where real estate comes from the term Lord of the land. Like being a landlord is the greatest thing you can do. I have not found a vehicle that can make you as much money as real estate and 97% own zero outside of their house. So we're talking about the defendable position here and it sounds like buy more real estate. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. Own more houses. Yes. Own more real estate. Here's, here's the yes. other thing. Yeah. 2008, 9, 10, we're flipping houses like crazy. The biggest piece I was missing for that business, the biggest was a machine, was an army of agents. Right. All the, all these team members that were hammering the phones for short sales and REOs, doing hundreds and hundreds of deals, wholesaling me as a flipper, seven mm -hmm. deals a month yep. and crushing and then cherry picking on all those amazing duplexes and triplexes all over LA. They're worth millions yep. now. Wholesaling yeah. is the greatest arbitrage play on the planet. Right? <laughs> He's like, oh, that's me. This I is a, this is a side note, but I was talking like for whatever reasons, it seems like every principle for home building companies happens to have a place in Newport Beach. I don't know why, yeah, but they all do, right? Yes. So yes. they've all been clients or kind of clients at some point, clients of all real estate agents, but sometimes mine. Um but what's interesting is there's this trend where instead of building multifamily right now, mm -hmm. they're going into Arizona, Indiana, wherever, and they're building tracks of yeah. homes. And the complete tracks of homes are not for sale, they're for rent. Right. And so I think like that's such an interesting trend as well. And not only home builders, but big hedge funds are doing the same thing. They're yeah. making single family residents. And it's not a new thing because it was happening in 2008 to 2012. Everybody's buying these tapes of homes. Then they were like packaging, renting them out, sitting on it. But now they're building. This is the first time I've actually seen them take down like parcels of land, build tracks, and they're all for rent. Yeah. It's uh, it's the longer play because we all know on the, on the development side, all the money's at the, the last 20, 25%, right? Assuming you don't have a mortgage company and all the other services. Um, so if you can build them at the right cost, Andy, you know this, and rent them out at market, you know what I mean? And have escalations over, you know, five, 10, 15 years after 10 years, you're going to refi the whole thing out anyway and take out all the cash. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a it's, no brainer. It's a no brainer model. I would love to go back to 2008, 9, 10 and have right. a very simple model for like every four houses that we flip, we keep one, we put in a tenant. We do the yeah. low budge fix up because yeah. all those houses, all of them have like 90% equity right now, if not more. And we're yeah. in a T1 city here in LA. There's millions that we left on the table. Yeah. But like, <laughs> here's a simple philosophy. I will continue to buy real estate and rent it out as long as people want to live inside. When people don't want to live indoors anymore, I'll change my business model. <laughs> you don't have to go to fancy restaurants. You don't have... You don't have to buy nice clothes. You got to live inside. When people right. want to live in teepees and yurts again, I'll pivot. Yeah. Until yeah. then, you, you have to live somewhere. I love I that. I think we need, we need to hedge and start buying tree farms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like lumber is through the roof right now. So like- I know, this, I know. And here's the thing. I've got some amazing mentors and they're in their 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. They only mess with real estate. And they've seen a lot of cycles and they're just like, just wait. Just yeah. Wait. Like, yeah. But so, it's, there's still deals out there right now. There's always deals if you're willing to hunt. So let's, okay, let's go kind of last direction. Let's, let's recap. 
why in the world did a seven hundred million dollar producer and a forty three million dollar producer join? We kind of we we covered that one. Can't, Will you can't guys you feel it? Can't you feel it? There's something going on here. That's what I knew like. when you were both texting me. I was like, oh my god, I feel like a yenta right now. Like this is the perfect match made in heaven. Now I just want to declare that in ten years we're like, okay, we're coming out again. It's the Rolling Stones. It's not the Beatles. You with? We're on the reunion tour of the podcast. We talked about where you get your listings. We talked about, you know, the focus around getting appointments. We talked about all kinds of stuff. We talked about defendable positions, buying more real estate. Let's talk about video marketing. The last three podcasts that I put out have all been video marketing, video marketing, Patricia Stark on, you know, how to show up right on the camera to, you know, 20 of the best ideas I think I've got on videos that agents should, should create. Um, I want to know from you guys, what are you thinking about next in terms of video marketing and what are you going to do to really blow it up? Cause right now you guys are still playing too small. So we have, we talked about this before. So, you know, my partner in the production company and good friend, Chris Stacy, who is like really like part of our secret sauce. Yeah. You know, we've been having this breakup conversation. You know, he's like, I'm not doing real estate films anymore unless we make a real movie. Right. So we started mm -hmm. thinking about like, and coming up with real estate film ideas, it's not easy when we've done a thousand films, right? Right. And let's be honest, we're still we're still coming up with some good ones, right? There's still some oh, yeah. good ones coming up. So, yeah. but one of the things with video marketing is we're creating a psych wall and a studio, green screen, do all sorts of stuff, mm -hmm. podcast, different things, because video content is like, but having what you're talking about right now, I'm looking at the backdrop. I'm sitting in an office. It's not mine. You mm -hmm. actually look lit perfectly. Yeah. You're standing perfectly. Your posture is good. Like that's like perception is value, right? So right. we're actually I'm not wearing pants right now, though. In case you're yeah, wearing. right. <laughs> He's got a speedo. <laughs> but we're 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 doing this, and my big thing is I don't want to be hung out. So we're creating this unbelievable studio that all of our agents can use to film. We can film stuff in there. We can green strip. But this is for real estate, right? This is yes. for the real estate stuff. But as a side thing, we're actually going to rent out the studio on a daily rate. We haven't even finished it and we already have bookings and we continue at bookings. So you start thinking, well, wait a second. Like this whole video thing is not just in our industry. It's in every sector. Yep. So I would say that would be it, but just creating, you know, more content. And then the other thing that we are hyper focused on is not just creating collateral, geographic digital distribution. Talk about that. So geographic digital distribution. How can I get in those marketplaces where I'm seeing trends of buyers come here? How can we create buyers for homes that aren't currently in the marketplace? And the only way to do that is billboard the shit out of them where they live. And how do you do that? I mean, I've tried. I don't know if you're, if D magazine is, or, Dallas Magazine is still 10,000 a page, right? But we yep. did a couple of those ads, but like doing geo digital campaigns has been hugely effective to creating more energy and really more buyers that weren't currently in the marketplace. But that, I mean, there's, there's a real skill level and a high cost to that. So you have to have a right. huge inventory to be able to subsidize that. I also look at there's, you know, look at like companies like Real Scout, uh, big shout out to Andrew Fletchner, uh, to Remine. Um, so Real Scout basically says, here is the buyer activity in your market, right? From a seller standpoint, like it's very effective to say, here's all the buyer activity in real time. And then Remine gives you the, the ability to do search query around who's most likely to sell. And I think marrying those two together, it's funny because I talked to both, uh, both those founders today separately on calls. Um, there's something to that, Tim, along with your geofencing, your Facebook ads, your Instagram ads, your billboards, like the, they, can't, they can't go and not see you, but then marrying it with the data. Because that's the beauty of the Zillows of the world. That's the beauty of uh, Redfins of the world, right? It's this beautiful interface with unbelievable data that prior to, you know, prior to them starting wasn't accessible to the average consumer. Yeah, right. For sure. No, it's true. And like, that's what we're like hyper, hyper focused on, especially yeah. for me, like being like somewhat like, you know, kind of new to this 
like, you know, zone is doing neighborhood specific content. Yep. And then, I mean, getting really specific with like, like the stuff with Google and Facebook. So it's going to go to those areas and then like seeing somebody from that neighborhood, like the local shop or coffee shop or something within those videos and then chopping one up for them, giving it to them. They then share it. It's just this like cross collateral thing. But what's been really cool for us to look at is like certain sellers, you know, are like 75% to sell the next like three years doing content for just that neighborhood, speaking to them that have a lot of equity. And then just, again, it's the mail, it's the video. And then it's the, like, I love to shoot content with like a certain thing behind me that I know is going to say it's Naples, or I know it's going to say the Heights landmarks. Like it's just, and then it's being consistent with it. Yeah. We've covered a lot of ground here. It's interesting though. Um, I just can't think, you know, we're talking about like the local neighborhood stuff. I'm sure you guys have all seen what Christoph Chu did several years ago when he drove like every neighborhood on the West side, Beverly Hills, et cetera. And literally Timmy, he would just drive through and say, this is, um, you know, Newport coast, blah, blah, blah community. And he would just drive you through the neighborhood and talk about the homes, the home builders, et cetera. Those videos have, 3,000, 5,000, 7,000, 10,000 views on them. And you could argue like there's an element of people that are like, oh my God, I just want to know like lifestyles of the rich and famous. But my response is if I've got a local piece of content that is SEO friendly to a search in that area and I'm the only one that's got it, that was a worthwhile five or seven or 10 minutes of my time and then turn it over to my editing team. Like I think that's a no brainer. Do you guys know Tube Buddy, T-U-B-E Buddy? So, so Andy, get this. We've been talking about it for a while. So, uh, TubeBuddy, I, we, Tristan, when did we get on TubeBuddy? Like a year ago ish, two years ago. So you can go to TubeBuddy and you can actually t- so it's, it's a YouTube site. So imagine, uh, obviously Tim, you're going to get better analytics on all your videos, right? So that's cool. More importantly, you can go into TubeBuddy and you could do searches for Newport beach, Newport coast, Laguna beach, Long beach, seal beach. And basically TubeBuddy will tell you, here are the searches that are happening on Google in that area where there is no video created that matches the need. Wow. So I don't care if, if, there's, if there's like- It tells you what to shoot. It tells you what to film, Andy. Like that, people are like, how do you create content? I'm like, uh, you go to TubeBuddy and you say, what are real estate agents looking for that they are not currently being served? Create some content on that. Like that's how I do it. So for you guys, it'd be fun for you to sit down with your teams and say, let's, let's do a deep dive on TubeBuddy and have that as a regular cadence in our business to say once a month, let's look at what are the searches that are happening where there is no content and let's fulfill on that content. Even if it's super obscure and, and small, who cares? I want to own every piece of it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, just, just talking out louder. So fellas, we've been on here for a bunch. We both, so Andy, you and I have both done a podcast together. Tim, you and I, I think have done two or three, right? I'm super proud of you both. I'm very grateful for you both. I'm also very grateful for you guys, you know, taking time out of your, you know, 7 million listing appointments this year to just hang out and just, you know, talk and share your experiences. As we wrap this up, just kind of think closing thoughts. If you could talk to several hundred thousand agents in one shot, what would you want to say to them? What's the most important piece of advice kind of leaving this thing? And Andy, I'll go to you first. Sure. Like keep doing what you're doing and you're going to have to be consistent with this thing. And I know it's probably not what you want to hear, but if this is a super hard year for you, like just know I had one of the hardest three months of my life. And yeah, I was just like, like there was a couple of days. I'm like, I'm just going to show up at the office and I hope it gets better. Like, and I'm doing everything I'm supposed to. I'm marketing my face off. I'm spending tons of money and it was crickets. And then all of a sudden, seven listings in a week. Like I just knew at some point it was going to break. I've been on cold streaks my whole career off and on. At some point they break. But I don't know. For me, it's just one of those things where join a team, get around people that are crushing and doing what you want to do and do those six things that Tom just said. And if you still aren't successful in a year, it's probably you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think the overarching thing you said it earlier is be consistent, be consistent with whatever you do. Timmy, closing thoughts. 
So I, I think the biggest thing I've had this year is like it's mindset and like morning routine and like not forgetting about yourself because I think there's a lot of like warriors. I mean, you I got to believe if you did the data on your agents, they outperform all other agents. So maybe they don't need to be told to work harder or to script better. Some yeah. of it, it's just like you have a way of this. This business has a way of like taking your soul, right? Yeah. And so you have to do what makes you feel good and makes you really perform and mindset's key like casey lesher one of my favorite agents yeah. and good friends yeah. he sends me a text the other morning and i should read it but he's basically he's like dude every morning i think of you for the last week telling me to eat the frog just do the worst thing first i'm like bro i just ate two of them and i got fired on one and this <laughs> happened and we're like hitting up but i'm just like yeah. but taking care of yourself I'm yep. 46 as of last week has become a hyper, a hyper focus because it's easy to lose yourself and you yep. can't really perform and be consistent and intense unless there's some like personal fulfillment in your family, in your relationships and I'm all about personal growth, like all about like getting better, you know? So yep. that's like a big part of it because we could all die today and guess what we could bring with us. Nada. Right. Nada. Not a so it's like 90% of our energy and our focus, like we're building to a bank account that's going to be reset when we die anyway. So why not spend a little more time doing that other stuff? It makes you a better agent. It makes you, a, I mean, the journey better. I love it. I love it. I love it. So that's, there's a couple of mic drops in there. So fellas, thank you so much for my friends that are out there listening, watching, um, leave a comment, connect with these guys. You can Google them both. They're super easy to find. Uh, I find both to be very accessible. Uh, you know, they partnered up. So I think we all need to watch this journey together and keep cheering them on as, uh, as Mick and Keith and not as, uh, you know, John and Paul, I think the future is going to be really, really sensational for both these guys and everybody associated with this team. So congrats guys. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Please leave a comment and we'll see you next week. Take care.